welcome to Rebecca Sounds Reveille. I am jazzed to tell you about our guest tonight because, oh man, you're going to have so much fun with him. He's an actor, an author, a screenwriter, casting director, a producer, a director, and a reality show host. He is known for numerous roles on television and film. You may have even seen him in, let's see, Ophelia Reborn or Extinction Level Event, maybe Rizzoli and Isles, or even Dr. G Medical Examiner. Some of us like all of these shows, and I'm super excited to share more with you. But you may have even seen him on America's Got Talent and, wait for it, Guinness World Records Unleashed. I am so anxious to talk about some of this stuff, but he regularly hosts a show, his show, The Ronald Show on Rumble, and he is known for his published work, Hollywood and Vine, which yes, is now on film. And we're going to talk to him about his role in that. And he's known for how to write a screenplay in 30 days or less. Get your groove on guys. Cause here he's got, he's got the insight, but there's so much more to his accomplishments. I could list this all day, but he has really achieved so much both as an author and in entertainment. I got to though, I just got to do this. I've got to give you a piece of trivia before we even get involved in our chat. Your job is going to be to try and figure out how he became the TV's, wait for it, most recognized plunger thrower. And by the end of the chat with him today, you're going to know the answer. Welcome to the show, Ronald Russell Farnham. Oh my goodness. Thanks, Rebecca. That's me. I'm the... uh most recognized plunger thrower. Yeah, I appreciate that. You said you had a little thing you were going to talk about. So uh, that's right. That's right. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome. I'm so excited because you're so involved in so many things. And not only that, but you've got personality and you're out there and you're doing things. And I was delighted to find out that this talent and the interest that you have just on when you went on AGT was, I mean, it was so engaging. And so I did want to make sure to mention that while we talk today. Thanks. That You know, it's interesting. I went on America's Got Talent because I really did want to try and break the record of hitting the most plunger, you know, shirtless men with a plunger in one minute. But I also used it as kind of a teaching point because I'm a, I'm a sports coach. I coach my nephews in baseball. I, I, I almost played professional baseball. I'm into like mentoring people and so that thing with the plungers when i'm on stage and i say hey you know i played college baseball and i figured i i'm a, and i was a good a really good left-handed pitcher i'm still a good left-handed pitcher i still get emails and phone calls for people who want me to go pitch in baseball tournaments all over the country i i think i'm going to atlanta in august to pitch with the americans baseball club and so this is me. I am a really good, accurate thrower. And I figured I could do this plunger thing and I was going to try and break a record. I saw the casting online on Craigslist, as a matter of fact, when I was at home writing the script for Hollywood and Vine. I took a break, looked on Craigslist and for talent jobs in Hollywood. And boom, right there at the Pantages Theater, you know, they were looking for people who could do this, that or the other thing. And one of them was throwing plungers. And I was like, I think I could do that. And then I had also there's a story about me throwing it in the military when I was in basic training. So there's that too. And I thought, all right, you know what? I'm going to inspire people. And I said this on stage uh, to do something with their talents that they might not originally thought they were going to do it, but, you know, do it. Like I'm a baseball player, but I also am on TV trying to throw plungers too, you know, and it was fun. So I went with it and it was just trying to be inspiring to people and break a record at the same time, you know, and it was awesome. It was fun. I love that. I got to tell you, it really was so engaging. I was, so drawn in from the very beginning. You went out there, extremely professional. And then here goes, you know, the shot to the plungers. And I'm thinking, okay, what's what's happening here? And it just went on. And I loved the fact that sh- this showed another side of you. And oftentimes we see people who are in entertainment and we don't see other sides. We see maybe something only based on a film or a role that they were in on screen. 
I loved this. And I was, I just, I, I really want everybody uh, to take a peek in that because what you're talking about is what the show is designed to do. And that's deliver hope and inspiration, tools, resources. And you just said it, you're a mentor and you're teaching people. And this is one of the tools. I mean, just, this is so exciting. I really, I really enjoyed that. So I've, I've got to just, we're going to go back just a little bit because you got into entertainment for a reason and you had a pretty major debut. You mean uh, as far as uh, when I got into the entertainment business in the beginning, when I was doing live theater and commercials and when okay. I was a spokesperson and stuff? Yes. Yeah, you did. Yeah. You know, it was interesting. I was working for the Department of Defense um, at Southern Command down in Miami in 2002, 2003. And I had always played baseball. Like I mentioned before, I was used to having a, a ball and being on the pitcher's mound. And then I also did plays when I was in grade school. Mm -hmm. And um, and I also sang in a band and played the drums. <laughs> and I still play the drums. And my buddy Edwin and I were we're putting another band together and, and sometimes I go do open jams and stuff like that. And some of my friends are like, I'm friends with members of world famous rock bands. And so I love the music industry and, and I'm used to performing and uh, acting was always something and comedy was something I was always interested in. I've done stand up comedy too. And uh, I just have this uh, natural either ability and desire to like perform. Mm -hmm. And be there in the spotlight and having to do what I got to do in that moment, whether it's throw a pitch or remember a line or hit a mark. And so, um, you know, came to a point when I was working in the military government sector down around 2002, 2003, I started taking acting classes again at Nova University down in Miami. I was down there in Southern Command as a counterterrorism analyst at that time, writing threat assessments on Latin America, South America, Central America. and. Uh, so I took these acting courses and my, I started going on auditions and I started booking roles. And at a certain point, I was like, geez, man, I'm, I really love the entertainment business. And then one thing led to another and I directed some stuff and casted some stuff. And it's just boom. And I got the spokesperson job for Louisiana Iced Tea. And that commercial just like kind of launched me in Florida and the Southeast. Mm -hmm. You know, it's amazing the things that kind of we get involved with and we don't see coming and it makes such a difference when we are really active in doing things. I was really excited to see the things that you did. I, when I first learned um, a little bit, just a little bit about you, I was completely fascinated. And the more that I began to learn about the other things that you did, it was just amazing to see across the board how many different talents that you have and the skills and the accomplishments that have come along your way. And this started very young for you. Oftentimes we don't pay attention to that passion that we have inside. Yeah. I always, when I was a little kid, my mom put me in gymnastics when I was like five or six years old, my sisters and me put us in uh, South Brevard Academy of Gymna gymnastics in Florida over on the beach side in uh, Melbourne beach. And, uh, and then at the same time I was playing baseball and then uh, I was taking piano lessons at the same time and then also going to school. And, you know, so my parents just threw us into all of these activities, probably because they didn't want to have to babysit us all the time or, or watch <laughs> us. It's like, here, please take our kids for a while. And so I was always like, you know, I uh, had a schedule and was taking lessons on something baseball. I used to go to baseball school, professional baseball school every year. And then I started taking drumming lessons. So. I didn't realize, I, I didn't really think of it long term, you know, just being a kid and, and wanting to do stuff that I like to do. All that athleticism and playing basketball, I started playing basketball uh, and football. I started playing a lot of football too. And tennis, I started taking tennis lessons. So I just kind of got really good eye hand coordination and I learned to really kind of uh, be a solid in the middle of a team dynamic as far as either being leadership or, or crew, whether I have to be the director or the team captain or the quarterback or uh, just a guy, you know, crewing and helping carry stuff or do whatever. I've just learned how to operate within those dynamics and pick my role and then, and then do it, you know, so do, do it well. Okay, so let me let me just go back for a second. There's so many people that say, 
if you want really good skills in life to be in business, to be in entertainment, to be in anything, having been part of a team, a sports team, Mm. is the most crucial thing that you could do because it changes your entire view about everything that you're doing and how you become involved in different things. And not only that, but persevere through and sort of have the mind frame of winning or being successful. Do you think yeah. you think that was a really kind of a big foundation there with all of the things you were doing? Yes, because it taught me how to goal set and see what I wanted to achieve and then go and, and do it. And that helped me survive in Hollywood and making my own movie when I did Hollywood and Vine and, and then Horoscope and, and what I'm doing. So I set goals in sports. And I remember specifically when I was living down in Miami, I was also playing for the Southern Command men's baseball team. I, me and another guy, um, uh, another major, uh, we started this team so we could compete in the South Brevard, South Broward men's uh, baseball league, wood bat baseball, 18 and up. And I'm a left-handed pitcher and I can hit. And so I had a goal to throw like 100 miles an hour and be the best pitcher. And I worked out for a whole year down there at Southern Command, getting up in the morning, going to the gym, lifting, heavy lifting, and then throwing long toss in the morning and throwing a weighted ball workout right after my, you know, long toss. And then go in the shower, get dressed and go to work and go be a counterterrorism analyst right there in, you know, in the building. Because we built our own field right outside the, the, the building. And so that year and moving forward from there, I, I dominated. I had a zero ERA, meaning I didn't give up any runs the whole year. I led the league in strikeouts, striking out the most batters, and we won the championship. And my team carried me off the field on their shoulders at the end of the championship game, and I won league MVP. So, um, yes. just, you know, and I've been on a lot of championship teams. I play with the Americans Baseball Club, and we've been going to the Roy Hobbs World Series in Fort Myers for 33 years. And that Roy Hobbs, uh, that Robert Redford character from The Natural, there's this whole wood bat world series tournament of all different age groups from all over the world every year and we've been going to it i've won championships in that and been part of this team of people from all over the united states that you know we still play together we still come together i play with doug flutie sometimes uh the uh hall of famer and i've learned a lot from him as an athlete who uh you know knows how to go about his business on a sports field that guy's a really big time leader doug flutie yeah this is really exciting i Ronald, want to go back for a minute and talk about Hollywood and Vine because you mentioned it. And so that I think that this is perfect timing because you you wrote a book, Hollywood and Vine, and it has now become a film. Yeah, I, um, you know, around 2011, I was living in Hollywood. I was living there with Scott DuPont. He was my roommate. I met him on Larry the Cable Guy over at Universal Studios in Orlando. We met on set like around 2006 or 2007 when Larry the Cable Guy was shooting. Oh, and we I stayed, love it. Yeah. So we stayed friends and we kept communicating and he would contact me every year. Hey, man, when are you moving to L.A.? Mm-hmm. And then for like three years and finally in 2011, he's like, you ready to move to L.A. yet? And I was like, yes, I just uh, packing up all my stuff and I'm coming out there. He's like, great. I got a room you can rent. Boom. And so I immediately started writing screenplays and. One of them, the Hollywood and Vine was originally based on uh, one line and one concept about the contrast between cultures. Okay. And it was all about this person going up the escalator and a person going down the escalator at the Hollywood and Vine train station. And this person going up says, I'm at with a foreign accent because it was about foreign culture in America being persecuted by uh, U.S. citizens who are who. Really, the whole thing is about this land, this world is just land everywhere. There's no reason to call someone a foreigner. And that was the concept in my head. Like, we're all just living souls on this earth, whatever it is. Why can't we just be living souls, not making fun of people? And I wanted to spark this idea. So it was like, I'm at the Vine in Hollywood station. This person was coming up and this person was like, it's not Vine in Hollywood. It's Hollywood and Vine, you silly Russian. And then, they, and you know, and then it turns into a fist fight. Okay. Well. I know. And then it came, but it turned out to be Hollywood and Vine, the movie, but started out with that one moment. I think that that is such an important, I think that the whole, the plot, I think everything surrounding it is so important and it's crucial at this moment in time. I don't think growing up, 
and all of the things that you and I have seen, I don't think it has been to the degree as it is now. I know that there's different shifts that have happened, but where it's at right now seems, it just seems a little bit more heavy. Yeah, I can't imagine. I could not have imagined that the world would be in the place that it is right now. But honestly, looking at how everybody has been programmed to kind of manifest this rapture in Armageddon, Mm -hmm. it's like we're diving into the darkest times, starting some type of tribulation, you know, based on the Bible which everybody knows about, and we might be accidentally manifesting and we don't have to, you know, some people think the future is set in stone and that, and there's destiny and it's got to be the way it's got to be. But I think that we can really control our reality. If we can all think unmasked together, what we want our future to be like right now, we aren't really dictating our future. Our future is being dictated by, a bunch of uh, rhetoric that everyone is being kind of invaded with. And yes. uh, it's kind of almost seems like it's beyond the point of no return. I don't know. It's just kind of weird. It is a dark time and, and it really it, it's divide and conquer. And so this whole spark with Hollywood and Vine about cross cultures and where is this division? It's really mentally. We're just living souls. So we have an accent. So what? It's because we grew up some other area where they have a different accent. But that doesn't mean that we can't all help each other live more fruitful and peaceful lives together without all the stuff that we're going through, you know? It's so true. And I think you have such a great point and point of uh, perception on a number of levels, because oftentimes if we talk, if, if we say there has been, um, I don't know, conflict in culture, Everybody has something in mind based on the things that they have uh, experienced in their life. So they might think it has to do with color. Some people will think it has to do with subcultures and the different types of, I mean, you could really try and apply what you're talking about to all different types of things because there's so much more than just what we might have experienced firsthand there's subcultures, there's all these just other circles of cultures. And it could be from being in a redhead club to uh, people (laughs) who like music, you know, this redhead, redheads are sexy, by the way. (laughs) I just want to say that. (laughs) I mean, just even if it's music, you can segregate people based on the type of genres. So there's a lot of different things that come to mind, but it's important that when looking and listening and learning that we can apply the same concept to no matter what it is that comes to our mind in trying for unity and understanding. So I love that you have taken hold of this and the fact that it's the elevator, when you mentioned this first, I I grew up in, in LA. And so I was there during a time where there wasn't any uh, subway, I guess, if that's what it is, or train station. And I have yeah, the Hollywood and Vine train station. Yeah. Yeah, I've never experienced that. I've only uh-huh. experienced being out on the street there in and wait, I don't want to say that the wrong way. Out. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all took it the wrong way, Rebecca. Yes, I know, I know. Oh. Uh, but no, so you know, Hollywood Boulevard and Sunset Boulevard, the strips there at, you know, had so much going on, nightclubs and this and that. And so there was just a lot of activity. And I this is one thing that I haven't experienced. And so um, it's going to really be neat to see this uh, from an, from another angle. I love it. Well, when you look at Hollywood and Vine, I really just, I intentionally made Hollywood and Vine an up close street level kind of uh, where you can really feel and hear the sights and sounds of Hollywood, the street right there on Hollywood Boulevard, the walk of fame. I, you know, I've watched a lot of movies that are set in LA And you don't really get to see and feel L.A. You don't really feel it. It's loud on the street. I've walked Hollywood Boulevard a thousand times and it's loud out there. And and I wanted people to feel as if they were there in Hollywood. Some people say, man, that movie is so loud. 
you know, you can hear the cars and the traffic and the noise and the wind and, and it's loud, but you can also hear the dialogue and the music too. I just wanted to immerse people there so that people who can't get to Hollywood or can't get to LA or have never been there or want to go and are planning on going and are like, watch this movie, man. You got to see this. Like, I want to go stand right there. Look right there in front of the Viper Club, right there in front of Samuel French, right there in, in front of the Whiskey A Go Go, you know, right there in front oh, of uh, all those different places, In and Out Burger, the Wax Museum, Grandma's Chinese Theater, um, you know, you name it, all those different places, Madame Tussauds, just, I wanted to capture all of that, you know, up and down the Hollywood Boulevard, the signs, the Walk of Fame, different stars, and there's chase scenes and fight scenes right there. There's a fight scene right at the Hollywood and Vine train station where the Messiah, played by Kimberly Powell, and the female Russian double agent, uh, Sandra Roscoe, they have a fist fight right there at the top of the escalator at the Hollywood and Vine train station. I just, you know, wanted it to be dirty, kind of down and dirty and like where you can't look away from it. And that's what I really right. was doing. And I want to see it when I say I want to see it, because I know that, you know, it's available, but I want to see it so big. I want to see it on in in a theater where I can hear things the way that you want it conveyed. And, uh, you know, they, it, the acoustics is much better there than it is for me to watch it. Um, I do have a great distributor now, uh, Keith, over at Number 11 Entertainment. Yes. and uh out in santa monica and they have the deliverables and the hard drive they just they sent me new artwork last month and they're putting it together um and i think uh it's gonna get worldwide distribution as far as video on demand and and all that but i really do think honestly it could be kind of a cool cult film if i could get it into some theaters i would definitely love to do some type of a theatrical release even foreign i think it would be good foreign too because you know It'd be like uh, being able to watch a movie about two major, like, you know, some famous streets in England or Ireland or Australia or all these famous places that people are, cities are known for. And uh, foreign people that can't get over to L.A., they might want to, you know, check it out and they would really enjoy it because they can see it and feel it and hear it. That's true. And here's a tie in, though. I mean, this is a very cultural film just in that, just that what you talked about alone. Yeah, um, there's a lot of cultural elements that I did put into the film also as far as the street life there, uh, the cannabis world, um, the nightlife, the, the feel of the uh, tourists, the uh, multiple, all the different cultures just flood into Hollywood everywhere. Um, there's even the, uh, you know, there's a whole transvestite scene. Uh, in that too, you know, so there's a, I, I threw in some wild elements. There's the whole smoke shop world. Um, there's uh, just wild and crazy elements in there. And then I get into some conspiracies some about, uh, you know, where reality, what reality is emanating from possibly, uh, you know, who knows what we're in, whether on, on a spinning globe or a flat plane or some type of a simulation it kind of asks some of those questions. I put in reptilian shapeshifter about possibly these ancient species that are, you know, controlling the world. Maybe I put in some conspiracy elements to, to make it fun and interesting and things that I like that entertain me. Okay. Do you talk much about parallel universe? Well, in Hollywood and Vine, I do not, but I do have I have several scripts that deal with the parallel universe and alternate universe. One is called The Lines of Destiny, which is about time travel. And it is all about alternate realities and how we have got time travel and we're doing things to get into our reality. You know, I think one of the things about alternate realities is that your mind actually sets you into the reality that you're on. You could be probably in hundreds of different realities at the same time, but whatever you, you make a decision and now you're in this reality, you make a decision and now you're on this reality track. And I think constantly we might be jumping into different realities and, and that's what lines of destiny is about. And I have another book called, another screenplay. I don't know if I want to say it because I have some really good names. Oh, Titles are important. I so. want to save that for our next conversation. Just, okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I've got to tell you, um, I had, you know, 
I ended up stumbling on a film that was about, um, you know, parallel universe. And I've got to tell you, this actually gave me a different perspective. And I've said for many, many, many years, our, you know, our perception is our reality. And people kind of thought I was a little off for saying that, or just lived in this different world. I Mm -hmm. am someone that if I can think that there's, or see or feel that there's something sort of tangible that could actually happen in the world. If I'm from what I'm watching on screen, then I'm in. And so this, this engaged me and it got me to thinking, and I think that this is really important for everyone. We need to expand our questions in our mind and say, what about this? Is this possible? We don't have to be sort of programmed into, I get up at this time. This is what I do. This is where I go. This is what, what it is. There's so much creativity and there's so much more that we are now learning about our world quantum wise and beyond. So. It's it's amazing to start thinking about the different possibilities that are out there. Especially when you say quantum wise. I've been studying quantum physics now for oh, a few years in depth. I watched a lot of videos coming out of CERN, the European Center for Nuclear Research, that okay. employs the top 7,000 physicists in the world where they operate the Hadron Collider, this 27-mile pipeline underground that has four magnets where they smash photons together, protons, really. They, they have an a oxygen tube that puts out oxygen atoms, strips off the electrons, and sends the protons in opposite directions where they collide. And they're looking for the Higgs boson particle. And what they've said is we're not solid physical particles. We're not made of solid physical stuff. We're just these small energy balls, balls, fields of energy. That's it. So that made me really start questioning, okay, well, geez, you know, how much, how much does our mind have over our reality? When you say, you know, perception is reality, that is 100% facts because we're transcribing light energy in a picture on our brain and whatever we're transcribing senses, sound, smell, and taste, all these things that are just waves of energy coming to apparently physical glimps and things that are absorbing it and then pointing painting this picture in our mind it's it's not really it, it is our perception whatever we perceive and how we perceive it and what we perceive or what we think is happening is what we're going to i think paint as our physical rea- reality you know what you believe truly is what manifests out into the physical I, it's really fascinating to me to think about that. And really, if, if someone were just starting out to think in these terms, I would say, you, our mind is so powerful and the things that are along with it. So if you're experiencing something you don't like, it's time to take a step to the side, go left, right, forward, backward, whatever, and take a different perspective. I can tell everybody right now in a minute how to get their manifest their desired reality. It's very simple. There's two parts to your mind. You have the conscious barrier around it and you have the subconscious where all the beliefs are held. You have to penetrate the conscious barrier into the subconscious in order to program a reality and then for it to manifest. Whatever's in your subconscious manifests. Okay. So you have so the the subconscious cannot tell the difference between in time past, present, what has happened, what hasn't happened, what's a memory, and what is just made up. So if you sit down and you close your eyes and you think about what you want to manifest, like I wanted to manifest a team of great people like you, Rebecca, to be my publicist and to team up with Scott and to make my movie. And so I sit there and I visualize it and I think, and I feel really good. I'm like, oh my God, uh, this movie is going to be great. All the people are coming in. I can feel the energy. I'm shaking hands with Scott. We're on the red carpet. And I'm seeing and feeling all these things, and I'm right there. And then I believe it, and I do that for like five minutes, and I create this picture I want, and then I just send it out into the universe knowing that with all this positive energy and it's going to happen, and I let it go with trust, then I just leave it alone. It's going to go out there. It's going to create this standing solid waveform that's going to come at me, and I'm going to wind up standing right there, boom, in front of that reality that I thought of. 
And I've been doing that now for a while and it works. I can almost do it with the, with anything like, you know, anything I can say, I'm going to walk down that street and go five, find $5 in the grass and let's go. I'm going to go find $5 and I'll, and I know it. And I know somebody dropped $5 out there in the grass somewhere. And so I'm going to go find it. I'm going to walk around and boom, suddenly there's that $5. There you go. And then put it in my pocket and I'll, I'll walk home just to prove the point. I can go do it right now. It just happens. Like once you practice it for a while, you get really good at it and you can do it with almost anything. And uh, so that's it. You can manifest your desires by sitting down and giving yourself a few moments to create that desire and then throw it out there with a lot of energy and expect that it's going to come back to you and it's going to manifest. That's all it is. Positive expectation, strong emotion and a solid vision. This is really important the way you shared this, because I've worked with so many people for many years and I try to really share how important the power that we have within our brain is. And one of the things I will talk about is not, not allowing certain negative, which I call unhealthy things to come into the, in the brain, because we, our subconscious will tell our conscious to go do that. So for example, uh, I've got a glass of water in my hand and you're walking across or a plate or whatever it is, you've got something breakable, let's say in your hand, and you know, you can't drop it because of you know, the damage it's going to cause. So you, but on there, you're just, as you're holding it, you're walking, you're saying, I'm going to drop it. 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 And then what do you do? Drop you it. drop it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Power. Well, the mind has but one ability and that is to complete the picture that you put inside of it. I think Abraham Maslow said that. And mm -hmm. so positive self-talk is important and phrasing it properly as positive statements instead of negative statements. Like, I don't want to get into an accident. I'm not going to get into an accident yeah. today. I'm not. Well, if you say that your subconscious doesn't hear the word not or don't, it just hears get into an accident. But if you say, I'm going to go out there, I'm going to have a great experience in traffic. I'm always safe. Everything's great. I'm going to, you know, make all the lights. I'm going to be on time. I'm going to be 10 minutes early. I'm going to just take my time. Then that's how your ride is going to go. And uh, it's all about what you're programming yourself moment to moment, day to day, year to year to, to live and say and, and be. Most people are creating their lives haphazardly. And, you know, there's that phrase, failing to plan is like planning to fail. I, you know, I, I'm full of a bunch of catchphrases that I apply and it keeps me producing. You know, I could be lazy and do nothing and sit on the couch and watch stuff. But I decided to just be a creator and, and enjoy life. And then I'll just do that. And if I build it, they will come. That's kind of one of my mottos too. Like I'm going to make movies. I'm going to write books and whoever likes them is going to like them. And I'm going to have my voice and my message and make it as commercial as possible. That's why I made my entertainment company, uh, Enlightenment Through Entertainment. I love this. I think that this is extremely powerful. The messages that you have to deliver through the things that you write how you bring them to life, the things that you implement in your own life is such an amazing thing that you're going to inspire people on a number of different levels through your work. And you've already achieved so many. If anybody is um, wanting to see your work, they can go to IMDb. They can catch you everywhere. You're, I mean, everywhere you're at and see the amount of things that you're doing. You are a man that stands behind what you believe and you go after it. And perseverance is proving uh, the things that you're doing. And you even have a show of your own, The Ronald Show. Yeah, I started that around 2009 um, or 10, 11, 2009, really, when I was living in Florida, a little bit before I went to LA. And, I, and it was The Ronald Show documenting the collapse of life as we know it as perpetrated by the global military industrial complex. I thought, what the heck, man? There were so many things going on in the world. I could just see the future and I had read about it and started studying it. And I was involved in the Department of Defense for a long time. And I, I knew the way the things were operating. And I just one day was like, ah, I have to just start talking about this stuff on camera and just I'm going to start a show. And it became the and I just thought of it, the Ronald show. I'm going to document the collapse of life as we know it as perpetrated by the global military industrial complex. And, you know, no offense against people who serve in the military, but I just feel like worldwide, there's just a whole bunch of warring going on that we don't need. And so I started that in Florida and I kept running it every, you know, I, I made, I've got over 200 shows 
and I had a lot of subscribers on YouTube and my um, show was getting a little bit, uh, you know, it, it was giving a lot of friction toward what the agenda I thought was by the mass media and YouTube and Google and stuff. So they terminated my show. But I, so I took, and I had already got all my stuff, all my videos, my 200 episodes on hard drives. So I decided, okay, you know what? I'm going to put it on Rumble and then I'm going to get worldwide distribution for it. Instead of just putting it up on YouTube, I'm going to make a uh, 200 one hour shows that tracks the whole thing. And it's still going on today. I still make the shows, but I am reserving them for, uh, you know, distribution with my distributor. So I've got, I've got like so much editing and, and work and deliverables to get to my distributor that I think I've, I, I need to hire several editors and I'm going to be doing all this for like the next 150 years. So, but that's okay. I'm doing it. It gives me a purpose. It gives me motives and drive and goals. So yes. I'm going to keep doing that. Yes. I've got to tell you, I'm excited about so many things that you are involved with right now that we can't talk about. And we will be having you come back on to share them as we're moving along with you through them, because these are things that are going to make such a eye-opening change for so many people. And it's all so, so enriching that it's enjoyable. Also is on an entertainment level. So this is going to be a lot of fun. Let me ask you, so the audience, if you wanted them to get connected with you and, and start following you and, and just walking with you through the journey as you're going because you're changing lives and it's going to change change the lives of the people that are connected with you. What would you say is the best way for them to, um, you know, follow your journey and get involved with you? Well, right now, I really interact with people most on Facebook. Um, I put select postings on my Facebook wall now. And I, and I'm really responsive on messenger that, you know, my goal is to have a solid 5,000 followers on there of people that I'm all connected with. And then I also have Twitter and I'm getting a little bit better at Twitter, but I'm wanting to start engage people more there because I want to be involved with the community of people that I'm, that I'm speaking to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in one of my books, um, I have my email address on there too, the Ronald show two zero one one at Gmail. So I, I also communicate with people there. And um, just look up my name and you can see my books and movies. And then a lot of those links and stuff also have ways to communicate with me, too. But I like to hear responses from people about my stuff, whether they like it, how it inspired them, because I get I get emails every week from people who are buying one of my books right now, who that is meant as a major self-help tool for freedom and sovereignty. I don't know if you want to get into that one now, but, you know, I'm always engaging. And I, I'm not like trying to be one of those celebrities that's going to be like, oh, stay away. I have to have this shield up. Honestly, I've been a people person my whole life. And I, I love I love talking to people and finding out what their desire is and what they're trying to figure out so that maybe I have something that I've done or can offer or say to them that can help them because I know how to achieve all my goals now and I'm achieving all my goals and I practiced it and worked on it. but. I want other people to be happy. So however they get in touch with me, I'll, I'll always be willing to offer, you know, myself or whatever I have to them to help their world be better. You know, we're all making our own worlds around us. I love this so much. I Thanks. want to thank you so much for everything that you're doing. I'm glad that we've connected and uh, I get to be a part of the journey with you. I think we're so on the same page in so many levels. And those that are watching, listening, being able to convey the things that they're hearing through you and through just this conversation as they share it is going to make a difference. And I am really excited about the journey. And thank you so much for giving us just a little bit of you today. Well, you're welcome. Thank you, Rebecca, because I know this show is going to go out to like the masses. And this is one of the things that I've been really thinking about is I wanted my I wanted this opportunity. You're providing me with such a huge platform. And I really appreciate what you're doing. So thank you for having me on and believing in me. I appreciate it. I do believe in you so much. 
Oh, this is wonderful. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in to another episode of Rebecca Sounds Reveille. If you are really paying attention, there is so much going on in the things that we talked about today. I can think of at least a minimum of three highlights that Ronald shared with you that you can start implementing right this second that'll make a difference. And not to mention the films that he's doing that is going to change some things for you too. So I want to thank you for tuning in. I ask that you let everybody you know that's your friends and your family, everybody on social media, get this out to them as well as everybody that you don't. Thanks for tuning in. Oh!